What is the infinite banking concept? So many people talk about infinite banking in today's world, and it is important to understand what infinite banking is and also what infinite banking is not. Hi, my name is Josh Waxman. I'm the CEO and founder of Infinite Capital Solutions. We are a financial firm here in Brickell in Miami, Florida, and I am an authorized infinite banking concept practitioner. What infinite banking is not is a product. It is not a service. It is not something that you sell. It is a concept. It is a process. It is the means of utilizing an alternate bank as opposed to the traditional banking system, such as commercial or conventional banks. And the reason for this comes back to the problem in today's America. And the problem in today's America is that you finance everything that you buy. You either pay interest to somebody else or you miss out on or give up the interest that you could have earned otherwise. This is called opportunity cost. And in this example, this is straight out of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Nelson Nash is the founder and discoverer of the infinite banking concept. It is not a product or service. Again, it is just a concept. It is a process. And in this example, out of 100% of your disposable income, he uses these numbers. He says 20% is spent on your auto. 30% is spent on housing. 45% of your disposable income is spent on living and 10% or sorry, 40 percent and 10 percent is spent on savings however this is outdated as this is from the late 90s when in reality today 46 percent is spent on living and only four percent or as of 2024 3.8 percent is the annual savings rate in america today and so understanding this concept that you finance everything comes back to the concept that if you're going to take out a mortgage on a million dollar home, you put $200,000 down, you're going to have an $800,000 mort gauge. And for those of you that understand the Latin language, Spanish or French, mort means death and gauge means to pledge. So a mort gauge is a 15 to 30 year death pledge. And so at this $800,000 mortgage, you will end up paying $2 million in total payments, which is minus the $800,000 principal, which means that you have a $1.2 million interest payment. And although the interest rate might only be 5% or in today's world, 8%, it's not necessarily about the rate of the mortgage, but about the volume of the interest. The volume of the interest is more important than the rate of the interest. And you can see here with cars, houses, and living expenses that the volume of interest is very high, especially in the housing and mortgage business. And so out of every dollar that we spend, on average, 34.5 cents goes to interest. And for mortgages in the first five years, 86% goes straight to interest, leaving only 14% for principal. And so if you don't pay in time, you also get your assets taken away. If you don't pay your car payment, you get repossessed. If you don't pay your house, you get evicted and the bank takes over the house. If you don't pay your living expenses, usually financed on a credit card, you will continue perpetually being in 18 to 28.99% interest. And it's very hard to get out of that for the average American. And so this leads to the booms and the busts or otherwise known as the crashes in history. And throughout American history since 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created and federal income tax was also passed six months later. Since then, we have had five major crashes. The first being the Great Depression in 1929. We had Black Monday crash in 1987, the dot-com bubble 1999-2000, and most recently, the housing crash and 
the coronavirus crash. And these are the most two recent in 2008 and 2020. Now, typically for these crashes, you lose about 40 to 50% of your earnings of your balance, whether it's in stocks or in real estate or in other assets. And it takes at least four years to recover. If you look at a chart from 2008 to 2012, that's how long it took to recover. This one shows from 2002 to 2006, that's how long it took to recover. And the same thing is going on right now at this time. And this is because the current monetary regime, again, created by the Federal Reserve in 1913 at Jekyll Island, at JP Morgan's estate, which was a collusion, which is a partnership between the bankers who receive money through interest and the politicians who receive money through taxes. And the system that they created was as such that in the beginning before 1933, we had full reserve banking. So you went and put money into the bank. It was 100% fully backed by assets such as gold and silver. After 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the fractional banking system. And what this means is that up until 2020, they had to keep 10% of reserves in the bank, which means you went and deposited 100%, $100, $10 was kept in the bank, $90 was able to be lent out. As of March 15th, 2020, this is actually no longer true. And the required reserve requirements for banks is 0%. That means that they can lend out all $100 that you put into the bank to other people. And therefore, if you go to the bank today and ask for a large sum of cash that you have in your bank, they probably will not have it because they lend it all out. It is important to understand that banking is the most important business in the world. Without it, all business will come to a screeching halt. You must have a banking system before 1913 we had the national banking era which was otherwise known as the free banking era and you still had privatized banks then you created the central bank in 1913 and then you created the fractional reserve banking system in 1933 and this leads to major hyperinflation in the economy as you can see because they can print money whenever they need to they printed seven trillion dollars in 2020 as you can see from this is this chart goes back from 1960 but the m2 money supply from 1959 rather till 2023 this is how much money the was in the economy before covid and then you see this major jump in money and you might be thinking well how does that affect anything and it affects everything when you hear your grandparents saying, I remember when gas was five cents a gallon, it's because of the printing of money. The printing of money increases inflation. Today, we talk about inflation being the increased value of consumer goods, meaning that if you could go buy a soda for $5 and now it's $6, that inflation would be 20%. But in reality, the real definition of inflation refers to the money supply. And so this whole idea that we give all of our power, our financial freedom over to the major bankers and the major politicians and the Federal Reserve at the end of the day calls for a solution, calls for us to regain our financial freedom. It calls for us to buy back the financial freedom that we deserve. And you do that by becoming your own banker. This is the front cover of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, written by Nelson Nash. And if this interests you, I would highly advise you read that book because it is the foundation of everything that we're talking about today. Typically, when people buy things, we're talking about cars, houses, or paying for living expenses, such as your rent and your food and your water and everything that you need to live. You have three options. The first option is that you pay cash. Right, we hear about cash buyers in real estate. We hear about buying cars in cash. And yes, it is positive that you don't have to pay any interest, but the downside is that you actually don't gain any interest 
and now you deplete your cash. So if you had $100,000 in the bank and then you go put $100,000 down on a house, how much money do you have? The answer is you have $0 left in the bank. So you're depleting your savings. Most people save, 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 buy a house, and then they don't have any savings left. Same thing goes for cars. And if you flip it around to having a mindset of a consumer to the mindset of a banker, you also don't gain any interest. Remember that bankers make their money on interest. So the idea is to gain interest. The second option after paying cash is to borrow the money. You can borrow the money using my favorite kind of money, which is OPM. OPM stands for other people's money. And when you use other people's money, you again don't have to use your money. However, you're paying interest to somebody else and therefore you're going into debt. Now, not all debt is bad. I don't care what Dave Ramsey says, not all debt is bad. There is good debt that is debt on income producing appreciating assets. Cars are not that. Houses can be, but not your single family home, specifically multifamily apartment complexes, otherwise known as commercial real estate, which is five or more units, can be an income producing appreciating asset. However, you're still paying interest to somebody else. That's why the third option is to BYOB. Not bring your own booze, but become your own banker. And you do that because now you can put cash into your bank. You can gain interest for yourself and you can also compound interest on top of the cash and the interest. And you do this by creating some sort of alternate bank. And if you're gonna create an alternate bank, wouldn't it be important to have that bank have a high rate of return, a consistent rate of return? It would be safe, it would be liquid, it would be guaranteed. You would have tax benefits being tax free. You'd have no market volatility. So if the market goes up or down, you are unaffected. You would have received passive income. You would have creditor protection, asset protection, inflation protection, so that when they keep printing money, it doesn't affect you. You would have no probate. So in the event of a death, you don't have to worry about your family going through the court system. It would go straight to your family. You would have control over your money. You would have transferable ownership. You can manage it easily. There's no hidden fees, no penalties, reputable, private, and accessible 24 seven. If you were gonna create a traditional co conventional bank, you would have to go get a great piece of real estate. You would have to pay rent. You would have to pay employees. You would have to convince other people to go deposit your money with you instead of going to Bank of America, Chase, Wells Fargo, which is going to be a challenge. And so rather than having to open up an actual bank, you can create an alternate bank of which you are the number one depositor. Again, this idea is that you can have privatized banking. So you're not relying on financing and borrowing money from other people. You are now regaining financial control for yourself. And the perfect vehicle for this, the perfect vehicle for this, if you question what could you do with this, you can do it with real estate with a HELOC. However, you still don't have asset protection and they can still take your asset. You can do this with crypto, however, there is market volatility. You can do this with cash, although there's no passive income, and it's not going to generate income for you long term and have a high rate of return. So the best vehicle for IBC, which again stands for the infinite banking concept, is properly designed dividend paying, which means passive income, dividend paying whole life insurance as it fits every quality of the perfect investment, the perfect bank. Life insurance is not an investment. Life insurance is a warehouse for your wealth. And the whole concept is that your need for financing in America is greater than your need for death benefit. And the reason is because this is how the life insurance banking system works. Again, banking is a process, not a product but people pay premiums into the money pool. Now, Nelson Nash is very adamant that there is only one pool of money in the world. It's analogous to the fact that there's only one pool of water in the world. 
Then you have the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean. They are separate oceans. However, they all flow through one body of water. You have JP Morgan, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. However, they all flow back to the Federal Reserve, and even the Federal Reserve flows into the World Bank. This bank, the reason it's called the bank, is because it's analogous to the river bank. And the reason that we have current C is because it flows like the current of water. That's why you can think about the banking system or the money system in the world as how the water operates in the oceans. And so you pay premiums into this pool of money and dividends are being paid out, which are passive income for the policyholders. There's also the expenses of the operation where the insurance company has to pay for their people, their employees and the management, right? That's the cost of the insurance. And then death claims. Every time somebody dies, the insurance company has to pay money in the form of a death benefit to their beneficiaries. Now, so what does the life insurance company do with the money? They have three options. They either lend money to the policy owners in the form of policy loans. Now it's important to understand that you are not borrowing money from yourself and you are also not paying yourself back. You are borrowing money from the life insurance company with your cash as collateral. The second option is to they invest in mortgages, mortgage-backed securities. They usually invest in big time real estate deals. And then third is joint ventures such as businesses or other ideas like that. And so all of this money is being pulled into this one money supply. And currently, with some of the companies that we use, the policy loan amount is only 4.85%. You can't get that at major banks. You can't get that for a mortgage. You can't get that for an auto loan. So let's say that you borrow money from your life insurance company to pay for a house. Instead of paying eight point, let's call it eight five percent interest, you're paying four point eight five percent interest. Now you're netting four percent positive. Nelson Ash would still recommend paying eight point eight five percent, which is the market loan rate, not the policy loan rate, because now you can put this four percent back into the life insurance company and they're going to add that as additions to your life insurance premiums. Therefore, you will compound interest on your cash and your interest on top of what you're paying every single month in premiums. Now, how do you actually implement this? Implementing IBC requires an entire change on priorities of your life. Recognizing that controlling the banking function personally, meaning bringing the banking function back to the level of you and me, is the most important thing that can be done in your financial world. It is highly recommended to work with a financial professional that is trained in IBC to act as your wealth coach. Now, let me define being trained in IBC means you have taken the infinite banking concept practitioner's course offered by the Nelson Nash Institute. There are a lot of people out there, including my previous self, that did not do it properly. There are a lot of people on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok talking about infinite banking, but not really implementing it the proper way as it was designed to be implemented. And so you must work with somebody that's trained in it. And above all, you must be patient. Too many people look at life insurance as an investment vehicle. It is not an investment vehicle, it is a banking vehicle. It is a banking process that you can regain the control of your financial freedom and utilize it to then go invest and buy your cars, buy your houses, and pay for your living expenses and fund all the major purchases of your life. So luckily for you, I am a trained infinite banking concept practitioner and if you would like more information, please reach out to me directly through myinfinitecapital.com. You can also uh, direct message me or reach out to me in any other means through my contact information. And me and one of my infinite banking wealth coaches will reach out to you shortly so we can help you implement this process properly. Get back with whoever invited you or shared this video with you and let them know what you received best from this video. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you again soon.